All right, everybody, it is 6 o'clock Central, Central Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Adam Huber. I'm the Agriculture Natural Resources Extension Agent in Allen County, Kentucky. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, tonight's program, we're going to be talking about uh, utilizing timber stand improvement, native grasses, and prescribed fire to improve the, uh, the wildlife habitat on our properties. Um, tonight's speaker, we have Dr. Matt Springer. He's the Extension Wildlife Specialist here at the University of Kentucky. So he's gonna be the one presenting our, our program tonight. A um, Couple of things before we do get started. Um, if you don't mind, keep your video or keep your uh, uh, audio muted during the presentation. That way we don't have any background noise. Um, and also um, at the end of the program, I'm gonna have a short evaluation. It's gonna be like nine questions long. Uh, I'll put that in the chat box um, before you leave tonight. I appreciate it if you would go ahead and fill that out just to um, give us some feedback uh, about the program and, and tell us what you uh, what you learned about the program tonight. And then also, um, if you don't mind, type in the chat box your name and where you're from. Um, I'd like to get a, a little bit of a roll call there, the name and where you're from. Um, and so I think that is all I've got. If, if you have any questions throughout the program, you can put those in the chat box or wait until the um, the program the end of the program, and we'll be glad to answer any questions. It should last between uh, uh, thirty and forty five minutes. I'm not sure exactly how long Dr. Springer's presentation will go, but uh, we'll go until he uh, runs out of air, I guess. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Matt Springer. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere closer to about 40 minutes is the goal. Uh, that way we leave plenty of time for questions. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Um, what uh, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat box. I've, I've gotten pretty good with Zoom here in the last two years and, and uh, being able to to kind of uh, multitask and see the questions as I'm talking. So I can try to address them um, at the time you have them, uh, which I think is a much better way of of dealing with them um, while, while I think you're fresh. So um, Adam kind of asked me to uh, speak a little bit towards, um, you know, as he mentioned, forest management, native grasses and prescribed fire. Um, and, you know, it is, it is uh, prescribed fire season here. Uh, so it's a good time to, to chat about it. It's also a great time to get in the woods and do some, some uh, forest management. So I want to make sure I, I, I um, at least kind of hit the highlights uh, of many of these topics. Unfortunately, um, you know, literally gave a class uh, lecture yesterday morning to students on prescribed fire that went over an hour. So to try to fit all these in, in about 45 minutes is pretty tough. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can at least get you um, move it in the right direction and and um, some of the topics that you need to be thinking about as you approach, you know, whether it's your personal property, maybe your the land you lease to hunt, uh, and if you're trying to take an active role, things to be thinking about. So, um, you know, briefly, why do we even care about managing our lands? Well, first and foremost, um, things are a lot different now than they've ever been um, in many ways, right? Uh, our, our landscape is incredibly altered from what many of these animals evolved to live in. Um, for example, here, just in pictures, you know, of where I am up in the bluegrass region, uh, mostly when I drive to, to Lexington every day, I'm seeing horse farms. Um, and historically what was there was either a uh, savanna uh, habitat or giant cane breaks uh, that might've been one to five miles wide. Uh, so very, very different. Um, and, you know, as, as we move through and, and Europeans colonize things, you know, we lost some of these habitats. Uh, these systems changed drastically. Uh, some of them are greatly diminished. Um, and the reason I'm even mentioning this is because there's a giant push in wildlife management for native grasses. And that's because we're sitting at about 1% ish or less of native grasses uh, east of the Mississippi from traditionally what we had. So any chance that we get to get a few more acres on the landscape is going to really benefit those species that that focus on using those habitats. Yeah, um, on here. <laughs> that, um, you know, people on trying to uh, make sure that um, <clears throat> we can have those species in the future. 
whether they be game species or non-game species. Uh, and, you know, in essence, if you're not taking an active role in managing property, whether well, that... Guy, he got uh, a back grandma with those turkey beards. Whether mm. that be uh, public, or public property and our, our natural resource managers or it's private property, uh, and, the, and the property you're trying to personally manage uh, to improve it to whatever species uh, that you're trying to, to have around uh, in that area. If you let things just go, you kind of lose opportunities to, to uh, improve that landscape, provide more food, provide more cover, uh, and potentially increase the survival and population levels of those species. So, you know, all of you here um, or some of you may be here to sh thinking of the same areas, but most of you are probably not. Um, and with that in mind, you know, those areas, you each probably have your own individual goals and what you're hoping to accomplish on that land. Um, and all of those goals are going to be really specific to you or to your hunting group or, or your family that owns that property. Um, and generally, they're going to focus on certain types of species or habitats. Um, and if they're focusing on the species, you know, those plans uh, or trying to accomplish those management goals and developing plans to accomplish those management goals are going to be constructed to provide the habitat necessary to meet those species, things like cover, food, and reproductive needs. Um, and that's really important. And, and, you know, most of what I'm going to speak to today, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, keep that in the back of your mind so you can, you know, really as you take things in, think about how would I do this for X species or, or Y species? Because those two species may have very different uses of the land that you're looking at. And, and uh, depending on if you're trying to manage for X or Y, you may go completely different routes. So what are the things you need to be thinking about, right? So I mentioned food and cover, but for certain species that many of you are focusing on, so we heard the gentleman in the background talking about the beards in uh, Mr. McGinnis's uh, room that he's sitting in. Um, you know, for turkeys, you may need to be thinking about nesting habitat. That's not the case for things like white-tailed deer, right? Um, but, you know, it depends. So for a lot of our game species, our game birds, our, our um, neotropical migrants, we have to be thinking about nesting habitat. Sometimes it's brooding habitat. If we're thinking about trying to increase bat populations, uh, it could be things like hibernation areas, hibernaculums. Um, that comes up with bears as well. Uh, so it really kind of depends on the natural history of the species you are managing for. But if you're not thinking about everything they need to survive, then you're going to be kind of falling short on your plan and the overall strategy on trying to help those species on your property that you're managing. Uh, so you kind of have to do a lot of homework on the front end. You know, you may say, I want to manage for this species. We well, have to really kind of dive deep into what those species needs are and how does your property currently meet it? or how can it meet it based on what your activities uh, that you can put in place are. A lot of what we do in wildlife habitat management, right? So in most cases, we're not trying to, to specifically, um, you know, uh, go out and bottle feed a fawn so it's, it's <laughs> chances of surviving increase like we do for cattle. What we try to do is alter the habitat to provide the best situation possible. <laughs> Usually by increasing things like food, cover, um, or, you know, nesting habitat, and so on. And in order to do that successfully, we have to have some understanding of how um, landscapes are going to change based on our habitat um, management mechanisms, whether that's uh, prescribed fire, whether that's going in doing mid-store removal uh, in a forest, and so on. And, you know, there's a lot of um, science behind it um, and knowledge that we've gained over time, but it really kind of boils down to this idea of plant succession, that uh, almost all landscapes have a predictable path from, you know, a heavy disturbance event or starting from scratch in, in a way, all the way through time and how they're going to progress. And what we do is we look at those events and we figure out where we are in the landscape uh, at our property that we're managing. And we decide, okay, if we have certain species that need this habitat, then we need to do this. Or maybe we don't do anything at all if it's species that like mature habitat. So we use this idea and understanding of plant succession to our advantage whenever we're managing habitat. And really how we do that is, um, whether that's on a small scale or a large scale, is using disturbance events. 
So a disturbance event could be something like prescribed fire or a major fire in some cases, uh, or it could be just um, things like, that, that uh, simulate, you know, many of our forests um, evolved with having like lightning uh, kill trees or you have a windfall event, something that may be a smaller level disturbance that opens up a, you know, a small circle of sunlight in the forest. Those kind of things we can simulate through, um, you know, uh, a mid-store removal or a selective harvest. Um, and we know that based on, you know, those events, uh, his historically, we can pretty much predict what's going to happen if you make a hole in, in the canopy, what's going to pop up there. And, you know, we also know that the type of disturbance that we're using or trying to emulate does matter in how the, the area responds. Uh, one of the big problems we see with wildfires out west is they're so hot, and historically they, they really weren't, that they get so hot that they actually um, cause a, a, a basically a stalling out of succession. There's, there's really nothing that could um, kind of deal with that uh, degree of disturbance. So it, it kind of had to go back in and plant trees because the fire was so hot it killed the seed bank and there's no soil there that can, that can um, basically foster new growth. We, we don't thankfully have to deal with that very much in the east. Um, we generally have very, um, what we call lighter fires, right? So our flames usually are only about a foot to, to 18 inches high when we have a forest fire. They just burn the leaf litter off. We don't have that much fuel. It's very uncommon uh, to see events like we saw uh, down in Gatlinburg uh, about five years ago. Uh, that's really an unheard of fire in the east. It just doesn't happen. So our major uh, disturbance events that are kind of unpredicted are things like ice storms, tornadoes. Those are major events that, that can kind of alter how succession happens. But we can use things like small fires, clear cutting forest, you know, where we go in and, and have a major harvest, the timber harvest, um, and, and remove all canopy in the trees, uh, which basically sets it back to, to um, almost a grassland-like status where you have only annual plants to start with. Uh, we can do things with chemicals, herbicides to, to set things back. We can mow, we can hay. Um, all of these are, are events that you can use to kind of set succession back and, and basically move things from say, you know, somewhere around the shrub saplings back to annual plants. Uh, or you can take things, the extreme event from mature forest all the way back to the clear cut status there in the top uh, where you're, completely setting it back to start over. And the big problem we have and why I mentioned like why we lost habitats we're always after um, native grasses whenever we can get it is because we really um, like to see about 10 to 15 percent of every one of these kind of age classes in the landscape, especially in forestry. Um, we want to see a diversity of, of stand uh, ages uh, and structures. And um, what we're running into right now uh, is things like the Daniel Boone has maybe 5% uh, young forest stand currently because there hasn't been enough harvest going on or other natural disturbances to set the forest back. So where we'd like to see that closer to, like I said, 15%, we're kind of falling behind. And all those species like rabbits, um, woodcock, grouse, uh, are all starting to suffer uh, because that, that isn't there present in the landscape. With grasslands, it's the same idea where we lost those, those habitats, they're not out there. And what we have, if you just let a field go fallow, it's eventually gonna move to a forest. And um, unless you put a disturbance mechanism in there like disking or fire, it's gonna go and you lose that, that native grassland in the landscape. And we really haven't had the mechanisms in place to provide that, that disturbance out there um, to, to keep them in that grass-like setting. Uh, so, you know, this is just kind of another example of a smaller scale kind of transition where we have, you know, trees that fall over, die, those kind of things, they start things back up. And, you know, there's a, a suite of species that fall into each one of these age classes. Um, and when you think about managing for your property and what you want to manage for, um, this is a good way to kind of picture things of what do you have, where does my species fit in in terms of what I have available. The problem is this is too simplistic. Because um, many of our species really rely on multiple age classes to be present in a given area, 
right? So we know that deer are usually found in closed canopy forests. However, they do quite well in um, really thick understory early growth forests because um, that's where cover is for bedding. It's also great fawning habitat uh, and it provides a lot of food. So you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt and make sure that you're thinking about a complete picture, not just of where they spend the majority of their time. Going along with that, that deer example um, and kind of thinking about it in not just cover terms, but also your age classes uh, of, of habitat um, can provide by their nature more or less food based on what your species eats. Um, so if we think about forage for deer, right, so they, they're browsers, uh, so they're going to eat a lot of buds on, on trees. Um, they'll also eat a lot of herbaceous um, material that grows up in the understory, um, some soft mass, hard mass, right? So if we look at the bigger picture of, of age of, of forests, what do you think ha provides the most food for deer? Well, in reality, it's kind of this nice sweet spot in the six to 10 year old range. Uh, but most of anything under 20 years provides ample amount of food. Then there's this kind of dead lull area where you may have some food being provided. Um, you know, in this, this sense, this is actually for Western deer. So it's, it's um, not really oak hickory because if it was oak hickory when, you know, 200 years is not a great spot. Um, but you'd have oak, oaks and, and hard mass falling down. They don't really throw off a ton of acorns until they're you know 50 to 80 years old. Um, so you somewhat have a lull between where they can eat the tree and the buds on the trees, and then they grow up past that, right? They get to pole size, uh, but they're still too young to, to throw off meaningful mass to provide more food. But in the end, if you were to pick one age class for deer that would provide the most, you'd actually choose the, the young age class, uh, both for cover and um, amount of forage that it provides overall. The only problem that most people don't like is young age forest, um, just uh, like um, those, uh, you know, reasons that the deer like it in terms of predator cover, um, aren't uh, great areas to be able to see real far if you're hunting. Uh, so therefore it, it, it becomes difficult to hunt um, and, and therefore, you know, most folks don't get to see a lot of deer. Uh, it's just harder. Uh, and I get that. Uh, so um, it is what it is. But, you know, if you're trying to manage for a healthy herd, that would be one way you can go. And I see Scott uh, has thrown in here a comment. Folks in the Commonwealth seem to be afraid of fire. Have you uh, collaborated much with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife um, to advocate for more uh, succession on public and private lands? Um, a lot of our private and public properties should be more aggressively managed regarding TSI general habitat enhancement. Um, you're, and you're welcome for putting on the program on. Uh, your points are well taken. Um, I was actually out Thursday with a bunch of guys uh, at the Clay Wildlife Management Area with their, their folks uh, trying to kind of figure out ways to make our White Oak initiative that's being pushed through our university um, and Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife um, meld together in all their public lands. Uh, obviously, there's quite a few benefits from White Oaks and, and wildlife. Uh, a lot of um, the limitations that Fish and Wildlife has is really capacity. Um, they would like to take a more active role in, in many of the properties they have. Uh, it's just manpower is a problem. Um, and we're working on them uh, with that as well. Um, we're, we're taking our Kentucky, um, our fire cats, which is our forestry team that works on fire suppression with the Division of Forestry and U.S. Forest Service. Uh, and we're gonna try to mobilize them as another uh, prescribed fire crew. I'm working on getting my burn boss status this spring, uh, which will allow me to kind of take over a lot of the plans that they have in place and, and, and uh, hopefully put a couple more crews on the ground and, and maybe burn a couple thousand more acres each spring. Um, that's kind of the hope. Uh, we'll see, you know, that's, it's, it's all about it, um, building up capacity and, and volunteers is one way you can do that. And, and we're trying to active, actively engage with them to, to hopefully start that process. Um, obviously, we're going to get into a little bit more about um, prescribed fire issues with the public. Um, it's not as simple and straightforward as we'd hope. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a resistance on private land because of our 
um, previous legislation that made it very difficult to burn. Um, there's, there, you know, the, the, the messaging had been for so long that fire is bad, especially around woods, um, because we deal with so many arson problems uh, with wildfires in the state. Uh, so things are changing, uh, both in the Division of Forestry and, and trying to also figure out uh, ways to mobilize, to, to put more uh, black on the ground is the term we use. Um, so hopefully things will change soon. It is definitely a topic that we work on on a regular basis, though, Scott. So um, trying to get back uh, to this idea of um, thinking about your property uh, and, and um, the species that you're hoping to manage for. Uh, this is a pretty common site in Kentucky. It's a, a pretty healthy forest. Um, there's a couple things that would stand out and many, maybe some of your properties look very similar to this. Uh, you have a very developed canopy. Uh, probably a lot of these uh, hardwoods are about 80 to 100 years old, maybe a little older than that, which is super common across uh, much of our state because of the history of settlement and, and uh, how things were deforested and, um, historically with, uh, in many of the lumber yards and so on. One of the things to me you know, that stands out is you do have a well-developed uh, canopy and you have a pretty good herbaceous layer uh, close to the bottom in that two to four foot range, uh, but there's not a lot of a mid story present, um, which may be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but these are kind of, you know, I'm sitting here looking at things. This is the, the way you kind of need to approach your property uh, and be thinking about things is, as this is how a forester would look at it or a wildlife biologist going, okay, here's the gaps, here's what you have, here's what you don't have. Um, and how do you move forward? And you'd have to kind of know what, you know, for, for turkeys, this is actually pretty good. Uh, for deer, it's kind of on this, you know, you got a lot of hard mass trees in there, so you got some good food, but you don't have a lot of cover. So you kind of have to look at also what's around this stand and what's going on to make sure you fill in all those pictures. Um, however, a lot of times, um, and Scott, this kind of gets back to um, your, your question of, of trying to get more advanced uh, habitat on the ground and habitat projects, uh, and this is a problem that Daniel Boone has, um, many of our forested stands, um, because of their, their, their structure uh, and their composition, uh, could really do for a good um, clear cut uh, to, to kind of start things over, uh, because what may be in there might be almost all tulip poplar uh, or um, other lower value trees, red maple and so on, that don't have great value for many of our wildlife species. Uh, in that case, sometimes it's the best thing to do is go in there and, and start over. Uh, what we do know, based on what I kind of just told you a couple of slides ago, is if you do a clear cut in about five years, this is going to provide be, be very thick, provide a lot of soft mass, blackberries. Um, you might get some cherries and a few other things coming up. A lot of browse and a lot of cover. And it's going to really kind of hit that early successional habitat that's missing on the landscape and provide support for many of those species. The optics of something like this, and if you look at this, you know, I know what this is going to look like in two years, but um, the public sees something like this, especially in the Daniel Boone, and it looks, they don't like it. They, they, they think it's, it looks horrible. It's the end of the world. This forest is never going to recover from this event. So we're trying to figure out ways on how to get past that. Um, you know, clear cuts, logging in general, when you follow BMPs is a great tool for wildlife habitat management. And BMPs is best management practices uh, that are in place and, and scientifically driven for research, from research uh, on how to make sure you protect waterways, you don't rut up the ground, and, and, and make sure that you try to control invasive species so that your forest can regenerate naturally and recover from a clear cut in the way that you want it to. Um, so this is a challenge in itself. Uh, but one that you shouldn't be afraid to try to implement on your property because there's great outcomes from it. Uh, and depending on where you are in the state, there may actually be extra farm bill money to, to do a practice like this on your property because there's an initiative uh, within the farm bill for wildlife habitat that pays you about an extra $650 an acre uh, if you clear cut it, uh, depending on what county you are in. Big thing though, uh, I kind of showed a couple different pictures. Uh, and every one of your properties is going to look different. And that's that's a, a, a great thing in many ways. And it's also um, difficult for me to sit here and talk to you about what you should do. Because I can look at all these pictures here and there is 
depending on what you want to do, if it's all for the same species, I would approach every single one of these differently. So say we were managing for deer, I would do different things in each one of these locations. Sometimes I would maybe wait a couple of years to do anything at all. Um, so it's, it's difficult. And that's, that's where um, knowing that if you're in Kentucky, you have the access to a uh, forester for free of charge and a uh, private lands biologist with fish and wildlife if you have over 25 plus acres. Reach out to them, use them. They will come out to your property, walk on your property, listen to what your goals are, uh, and, and try to help you um, come up with a plan uh, to meet your goals. So Scott's asking our question, are agents seeing an increase or decrease in private land owners uh, showing interest in learning how to not only manage for wildlife, but also seeing an economic return? I'm finding more landers who are purchasing land for hunting. They're young and educated. The rest of the population really is ignorant in forest management. Maybe a great time to beat the bushes on behalf of management to inform folks of timber prices, harvesting, et cetera, for income by our county agents. Scott, great point. Um, we're making a, a push for a training program for our agents here, uh, being led up by our, our new civil culture extension faculty to do basically a forestry 101 for all of them to kind of update them on, on timber practices, landowner practices, uh, harvesting information. Um, uh, also wildlife is going to be a component of that, forest health is going to be a component of that. So we're, we're going to try to hit them up hard on, on just giving them a, a, a quick down and dirty of, of overall why they should care about their woodlands. I'm hoping that's going to hit um, here this summer, but uh, like I said, it's my, my new colleague that's, that's leading that up. So it's based on his timeline. I'm just helping out. Uh, but your point is well taken. Um, landowners in general, um, I can tell you though, unfortunately is the majority of them still don't see their woodlands as a resource. Uh, you do get a lot of those folks that are interested in hunting, uh, on, from, from my perspective, it's, it's great that they're interested in that. I have a, um, a barrier trying to get them to think more outside of just single species management. Um, thankfully folks seem to be kind of buying into that and I'm, I'm really hopeful that continues. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, we're working on, on, on the entire trying to build capacity, build education at the localized level with our agents and other folks to try to keep that message fresh in their mind and, and in the local communities. So every situation is unique. You have foresters and wildlife biologists that you can tap into in Kentucky here and don't hesitate to reach out to them. They're looking to get out there and help you out uh, for the exact reasons that, that Scott's kind of mentioning of um, if you're excited, they want to be there and help you get things on the ground and improve the resource that you have. Um, one topic, you know, in that first picture there, I was talking about those oaks and, and the understory. Um, big thing you need to be thinking about whenever you're looking at forest for forest management, especially with wildlife, is the concept of vertical structure. Wildlife rely um, on, on structure in different ways and for different reasons. Most of the time we think of structure in the shrub, forest floor, understory level for cover for a lot of what we pursue for wildlife in terms of game species. Many of our non-game species though depend heavily on things like the midstory and upper canopy like our neotropical migrants uh, on what that looks like and what species are present there. Um, so whenever you're walking through your woods, you're not just looking you know, at the bottom and at the top, right? Do, does my, are all my white oaks dropping acorns this year? Uh, and, you know, is there, there um, browse at the two foot level on the ground? You want to make sure you're, you're thinking about things from, from forest floor to forest, to the top of, of the very last leaf uh, at as high as you can get. Um, and it's a holistic approach. So I want to just make sure I mention that in there. So many of the times we're looking at with forest just manipulating one of those structures, right? Whether that's the canopy or the forest floor or the mid-story to do things like increase food, increase cover. And that kind of can take a couple of different ways, right? We can look at trying to increase hard mass, which is gonna happen at the canopy level or increase soft mass, which can happen both at the canopy level, but much more often it happens on the forest floor. Um, and then there's something in between where if you're focusing on things like deer and elk, uh, or rabbits, um, songbirds, you can, you can create browse, put buds in the ground, or make brush piles to help provide both food and cover. But it all depends, like I said, on the wildlife species. Um, and in many ways, um, you know, I've talked about the clear cut, but simply opening up the canopy 
will cause a drastic increase in all of these items. Uh, because if you let light hit the ground, you're going to get a fresh burst of growth, uh, which usually is going to mean soft mass species, cover, and food. We can also do things that manipulate uh, forest structure and, and um, composition through things like uh, TSI, which is timber stand improvement. Um, we can do things like hinge cut, which or live cut uh, or live hinge um, trees as part of that process uh, to not only open the light up to the forest floor, but also put cover on the ground uh, and, and buds in the ground uh, in the process. So what, is that, what does this all mean? What are the practices that exist? Um, well, there's really four common um, timber stand improvement, or now it's actually called forest stand improvement practices. Uh, things like crop tree release, which I'm going to get into in a second. And then you get into low thinning, where you may be removing uh, younger or lower, uh, smaller trees, uh, so that you lessen competition for the uh, larger trees that you have, and also the competition for those on the floor. Uh, you get into things like coal tree removal. Um, low thinning is also sometimes you get uh, is hand in hand with um, mid-story removal, which is what is actually pictured here, where you're taking out you know trees at the eight or less dBh um, to lessen competition or let more light on the ground. Uh, so you, it's a great tool to change forest composition because you can take out certain species of trees that you don't want to see ending up in the overall canopy long term and promote those that you do. So you may take out things like maples or poplars while promoting hickories, oaks, or other mass producing trees or higher timber value trees. Um, that's kind of, you know, without getting into super amount of detail and, and there's an art to it, um, that's the kind of bigger grasp of things. Um, Though there's a coal tree removal where there's trees that are in the canopy that are just never going to amount to much in terms of timber, timber um, or economic benefit, I should say, and uh, they really aren't providing an, a, a giant service for wildlife. So you want to get them out of there. So you open up that canopy and that space to get something in there that does have more value. And, you know, I can't, you know, anything, whether it's in, in timber stands, grasslands, anything, you don't want to let invasive species get a hold. Um, they're going to, A, not really provide as much food or cover. Well, sometimes cover is not really the case, but food uh, or ecosystem services like our native species do. Um, and they're going to compete for the, with those native species. You want to get them out of there. You know, uh, probably the, the number one hit list that we have in Kentucky here are things like um, honeysuckle, uh, autumn of are really two big ones. Um, kudzu uh, is, is another one, you know, that can create a carpet um, and then really don't provide a lot of, of um, resources for wildlife and, and compete heavily with our, our native plants. So these are, are the basics. Now, what, how do these work? Well, things like crop tree release are you're picking out trees, generally um, hard mass trees, or trees that have high timber value that are close to being of harvestable size and, uh, or age. Um, and you're trying to just kind of finish them off or with the, the hard mass side, you're trying to create openings to allow that tree to expand its canopy uh, and, and potentially egg grow and then produce hopefully more acorns uh, or other mast along with it. And you can do this in a couple different ways. You can, you can do it um, a, a one-sided release or all the way up to a complete release. And you know, in the picture here, the image, it's that, that green tree is the one that you wanna let go and release from competition and let that, that canopy kind of get some more sunlight so that it can expand and gather more resources uh, to benefit that tree. So you're just trying to take out anything that may be touching that canopy or overlapping the canopy and competing with that tree. Um, so hopefully you get somebody that knows how to use a chainsaw and doesn't cause a tree to fall into the one that you're trying to, to release. Uh, so there's some skill involved in some cases, um, but the, the main goal here is to, to basically take the competition away from this tree and allow it to um, go through a very quick spurt of growth, uh, either for timber reasons or to produce more uh, mast. In addition, in between that growth of the tree canopy for a couple of years there, you're gonna get some um, more light down the forest floor, uh, which is gonna help promote regeneration 
uh, underneath. And if you're going in there to remove that tree for timber purposes, you already potentially have the replacement trees started to fill that gap underneath. It. Uh, other items that I didn't kind of mention that was not really timber stand improvement, but our general wildlife forest management tools, ex especially on edges, whether that be agricultural edges or native grassland edges. Um, and that's the idea of edge feathering, where you're basically softening this transition from a uh, non-forested area into the forest. Uh, and what you're doing is um, on that edge that's not forest, you move in and start taking out uh, in about 30, you know, 15 to 30 foot increments, less and less trees. So on the very outside edge, you may remove about 80% of the overstory. You go down there 20 feet in, 30 feet in, you, you remove maybe 50% and then 25% and then you transition to the full forest. And what it does is you're basically um, creating early successional habitat, forest habitat, because you're letting that light penetrate to the ground. Uh, and you're softening the transition. So you, you don't, instead of going from like hard uh, cattle pasture to 80 foot uh, oak trees, you're going from hard cattle pasture to herbaceous layer, maybe some sumacs and, and other soft mass producing trees that are really thick. Uh, get a couple other, maybe some smaller trees like persimmons and, and other things that produce food uh, that are more um, apt to grow in open light conditions. And then you eventually transition to the oak hickory uh, forest that you have. Um, it's a great way to provide habitat for, for early successional species like bobwhites and rabbits, uh, songbirds, um, with very little work and, and you don't have to give up a lot of ground on either your forest side or your agricultural side. Um, another more immediate issue that we have, and especially with things that are um, smaller mammals, uh, birds that need cover, you may have a mature forest stand um, and, and, you know, or you maybe you have a pine stand, um, which is, this is a great practice for those where you really don't have anything growing on, on the forest floor in terms of herbaceous cover. Uh, and you want to get that out of there in some situations. Uh, one of the things that you can do, right, so you cut a bunch of trees down or, or you got some logs that you can't, you know, really use for timber purposes, you can take those materials and create these wildlife brush piles by basically piling things up, you know, larger logs on the bottom to create some gaps and spaces for animals to get underneath and throw a bunch of the, the leaves and sticks on the top um, to provide cover short term while um, the vegetation community responds to that new light condition. Um, great for quail, rabbits. Um, if you do it correctly where the, the logs are spaced small enough um, you know, it's, it's not like uh, things like coyotes or bobcats can get in there or foxes can, in, can get in there. Uh, so it's a great nighttime roosting spot. Um, you'll sometimes see turkeys with their poults uh, get up in, the, in these uh, in certain situations as well. So it's a, a thing to keep in mind as a potential tool based on your situation. Uh, and finally here, uh, I'm running a little bit long. Adam's going to get me in trouble uh, since he said 30 minutes, but I um, wanted to briefly touch on native grasses um, and thinking about how to get them on the ground. Um, so, you know, we have lost a lot of our old field prairie gra grasslands uh, in many ways. Um, probably the more modern version is, is through clean agriculture, right? So um, in the 60s, 70s, we had a lot of field edges that had uh, components that had, had, you know, grassland-esque uh, features to them uh, that allowed many of our species that are grassland uh, obligates to, to survive uh, in that system. Now everything is, is you know, pretty, pretty much um, planted and harvested uh, ditch to ditch, road to road. Uh, so we lost some of those features that were able to, to carry those species through. And in some cases, you know, I, I unfortunately am not old enough to hear about it or to experience it, but I heard about it with the, the pheasant and quail boom in the 60s, 70s. We saw the grouse boom too, uh, where it was kind of creating the best habitat they could from it. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's an early successional habitat. Um, it, we are, you know, missing out on, um, on it across the landscape at a very broad scale. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times folks with the best intentions want to do something for wildlife and they immediately, because of what they see, and Scott, this kind of gets at your main point, 
uh, the problem that we have is, you know, what they see on hunting shows and, and hear about in magazines is, is food plots, food plot, food plots, which are great if animals are food limited, but majority of our species really are not food limited. Uh, they're cover limited, um, especially winter cover limited. Uh, and that's kind of the downfall to things like the quail and rabbits that we see currently is they just don't have that there. Um, so, you know, in many ways you can do wildlife a bigger favor by, you know, taking an, a, a pasture field, kill off the, the fescue, disc it and just let it go, let it grow back into what it, what it wants to grow back. Um, but, you know, you can also be a little bit more proactive and, and try to um, pick um, what kind of, of items you want to grow back uh, through establishing native grasses. And, um, and there's uh, several farm bills that you can uh, access um, uh, that will help pay for it or even pay you, you know, CRP payments uh, long term to keep it there. Um, so, I, Brett, I see your question here. I'll get to you, uh, get to that here in a second about the switchgrass. Um, and and uh, if, if I don't get the answer you want, just kind of poke me again. Um, so how you would actually go about that, you know, you can do this a simple way. Uh, as I mentioned, where you kind of disc it and let it go program, they're going to want you to plant certain mixtures uh, and getting a good establishment is really important. And there's some work that goes into it. Uh, the good thing is there's also some resources available to you free of charge here in Kentucky uh, that Fish and Wildlife has uh, to help you accomplish that goal. First and foremost, uh, about a month prior to planting, you want to make sure you kill whatever you're going to plant that native grasses in. You want to get a really good kill, whether that's using glyphosate, plateau, um, or a mixture of thereabouts. Um, and uh, in many situations, this is the most important part uh, because fescue, the way it competes, it will actually outcompete any of the grasses you put it in there. So you want to make sure that that it, whatever you're working on, and in many cases it's pasture land. Um, that you get that fescue good and dead. Um, it is, it, it's incredibly important long term that that happens. In a lot of cases, um, even if you have a really good brown kill out in the area they plant, you want to be looking for it to come back up because um, it will uh, and try to spot treat it as it does. What, once you have your site picked um, and, you know, you get, you understand what's going to take to kill it to get everything going. Uh, you're going to want to realize what you want to plant. Um, and I mentioned that there's some NRCS programs. You know, there's a pollinator mix that is paying. Um, uh, it's in the farm bill as payments to, to you know, obviously benefit bees and, and butterflies, monarchs specifically. Um, so that's going to be much more forb heavy uh, to to get more flowering species. Uh, there's also now a working lands for wildlife grazing mix, which is going to be much more heavy on, on grasses that grow tall and thick uh, that can withstand some, some, some uh, flash grazing from cattle. Uh, things like gamma grass, big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass uh, are all part of that. And that's a, you know, that top right picture there is kind of an idea of what that kind of mixture looks like. Um, obviously, that's not perfect for many wildlife species, but it, it, they're all native species. They have a benefit. Um, and things like quail can survive in that quite well if it's uh, managed correctly and burned off every once in a while to, to keep batch layer in the bottom uh, down so the chicks can quail mixes that are going to have a little bit of forbs. They're also going to have a lot more bunch grass because quail need those bunch grasses to um, roost in at night for, for cover. And they're also nesting in that. Uh, and they generally sit higher, allowing there to be a... Um, uh, give the ability to the chicks uh, to walk through there when they're only a couple days old, which is one of the biggest limiting factors with fescue is it's so thick that the quail chicks can't navigate it uh, and find enough food to survive. So depending on your goals, you want to pick one of these mixes. Um, and um, thankfully, most of them kind of follow the same procedure of getting them established. Um, and then Adam, thank you for throwing those links on there. Those are great resources to give you a little more info on the, that program. Um, and one of the things that you do, like I said, you had resources available because these um, mixtures aren't exactly uh, like soybean or corn, 
Uh, so you can't just use a regular uh, planter to get them in the ground. Um, you need to use a, a special drill that's meant for native grasses, uh, native species. Uh, Fish and Wildlife actually has one of these drills that you can borrow free of charge, whatever you're trying to get these in. You just have to reach out to your local biologist uh, to make sure you can get your hands on it. Um, they will bring it to you and hopefully walk you through it. Uh, it hasn't been walked through that's used them. Um, getting an unstable mixture, uh, unstable message. You guys hear me okay? Okay, thanks Adam. Um, the planting season for native grasses is really in May, June. Um, our native grasses are warm season grasses, so they do most of their growing in the hot months. It's why actually using them for cattle grazing as a part of your overall scheme is a good idea because when our cool season grasses and our fescue stop growing and you really kind of have to keep the cattle off them, our native grasses are taken off uh, and can deal with it and do great in hot, warm weather um, and, you know, grow inches a day. So um, planting time for these guys is right there before it gets hot. Um, and, uh, you know, usually it, it's not a quick establishment like it is for many of our crops. It takes some time. Um, so you may have very little growth in the first year. So it, it's, um, you know, it sleeps year one, creeps year two, and then sprints in year three is the saying you hear folks talk about, uh, where you get very little going on the first year. Second year, you usually get some, uh, a, a burst that looks like it's taken off. And then the third year, it's like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. Um, if you're, it's a consideration to have if you're trying to work some of those working lands um, programs and plans in because you aren't going to really be able to graze it heavy until usually year two and fully until year three when it's fully established. And that's because most of these plants are really focusing their resources on their root systems uh, that, that will go down many feet into the soil uh, that allows them to deal with drought quite well. Uh, and they won't stop really getting their roots established until pretty much after year two and into year three when they start taking those resources and putting them into their above ground uh, plant structures. So once you get them established, though, in year one, it's really important that you work your way through those plantings and look for your invasive species, those fescue that didn't die, to try to knock them back then before things get fully established and they get harder to, to deal with. Um, if you are trying to walk through a third year planting of, of Indian grass and, and switchgrass, uh, it is not a fun experience. Uh, usually it's well above your head, super hot and hard to walk through. Uh, so looking for them year one where it's about hip level is much nicer to try to knock things back. And I mentioned this is, this is something that's really being pushed hard because a lot of these mixes are getting very expensive. Expensive. Uh, there's high demand for them. There's only very few companies that are actually able to provide the mixes uh, at, at any kind of level. Um, we are lucky enough to have one here in Kentucky with Roundstone. Uh, however, the demand for that seed is through the roof. Um, so I think the pollinator mix now is, oh, um, it was when I got here in Kentucky about five years ago, it was like $200, $250 an acre. I heard somebody say the other day it's up to like five or 600 bucks an acre. Um, now, if you're in the farm bill program, it's, it's, it's being covered um, and, you know, that cost has helped being offset. However, if you're trying to put some of those native seed plantings in on your own dime uh, and not in the farm bill, whether it's not the pollinator mix or whatever, those seeds are, are getting a little bit more pricey. Um, but what we see and what we found, and this is coming out of Craig Harper shop down at UT, is that if you kind of just go in there spraying kill back that fescue and disc that area up, the seed bank is still really diverse, full of all these native species. And if you go back in there and spend a little more time on, on, on uh, herbicide treatments, you get that same kind of, of habitat with less um, financial input. So it's, a, it's a, a thing to consider, right? So this is kind of that old field mentality. It still works great. Now I kind of, um, got through a little bit of that and, and part of this both with the far side and the grassland side um, that Adam wanted me to touch on is this idea of prescribed fire. 
Uh, and the big thing to keep in mind here is um, we're still learning about the best ways of using fire management. And it's a it's, it's a, a disturbance event. Our our hardwood forest had it. It was thought that the fire return interval was about every twenty years. Um, grasslands actually the best time to kind of put fire on is about every three ish years. Uh, we'll keep that um, diversity of forbs and grasslands pre pretty much uh, the same. If you burn on a much more regular interval, you'll get a you'll start favoring the grasses, and those forbs um, will start losing out. Uh, so you'll lose a little bit of your diversity. Uh, there is some effort on trying to figure out ways of using fire as a speed invasive species uh, mechanism, control mechanism, uh, usually in tandem with some herbicide treatment. Uh, but the, the whole idea between, behind the fire uh, and oaks is that oaks are, are, are pretty fire tolerant because of their bark structure, whereas things like um, beech, tulip poplar, red maple, they have thinner bark and therefore get killed back pretty easily, especially when they're younger uh, with any kind of fire, whether that be 12 inch fire uh, or, you know, obviously we don't want to get to the canopy side because that gets uh, hot enough that it even kills the oaks. Uh, but usually flash fires that we generally experience in our, our forests are enough to knock back those younger maples um, and, and try to kill them out of the uh, understory. Now, fire on your property, and this, it, unfortunately, um, Scott, this is right up your alleys. We've had a um, history legally that has set us up where we're not as um, culturally open to burning on, on, on property as those further south of us are, uh, or even further west of us, right? So if you're in the Midwest and the Prairie region, fire happens. If you're down south in the Pines, fire happens. Um, we are kind of at this point where we transition to the hardwoods of the, of the Northeast, where fire was not looked at as nicely as it is in those other regions. Um, and, you know, our division of forestry historically had a very poor view of fire and using fire that has thankfully changed. There's been law changed a couple years ago that that has put in place a process through the Kentucky prescribed fire council um, on how to become a, a burn boss or or obtain the education you need to put fire on your property. Uh, the, you know, there's, you know, plans that go in who you need to inform if you're burning and so on, they try to provide that education. Uh, but the best thing you can do on, on the short term, very quick and easy answer here is reach out to your local division of forestry office or fish and wildlife, and they will walk you through the steps on how to, to get fire on your property if you're interested. It is definitely a tool you wanna to be thinking about if you have native grasses on your property. Like I said, you're gonna to wanna to try to disturb them about every three years. You can do that with things like hang and disking, um, but fire is really the tool that will get rid of that thatch layer that builds up on the bottom that kind of limits things like rabbits, uh, quail, turkey pults uh, from walking around and using that resource as they normally would. Uh, so I'm going to kind of, it fire is a super complex issue. Um, and, you know, we, I mentioned I was out with Fish and Wildlife folks on thir last Thursday talking about White Oak Initiative, and we we're talking about fire on that area, they, they burn clay wildlife management area heavily. Um, the entire thing gets burned almost every three years, 6,000 acres, majority of it is forested. Um, so they, they put a lot of, of fire on the ground there and they're still not seeing the results that they expect uh, in terms of oak regeneration. And that's because there's more going on. And, and each stand we had the foresters out there, they had like, I wouldn't burn this until eight years in, or I wouldn't burn this for 10 years in. Uh, so it gets a little complex based on what you're seeing in terms of tree regeneration, what you have for the ability to recruit. You know, you, we're talking about going out and counting acorns in, in, in August to know whether or not you want to burn in February. Um, so it depends. And, and that's where you really want to try to rely on those natural resource professionals that you have the ability to as much as you can. So big take home here before we get to some questions, and I hope there are some, is um, you know, all of your management plans and strategies on your properties really dependent on what species you want to promote. Overall, though, the big things you can do is any kind of diversity of forest and grassland succession, so ages and structure, is great. You know, the more diverse you can offer, 
uh, especially at larger scales, right? So if you have 10 acres, you don't want to pr necessarily provide a lot of diversity. You want to look at your neighbors and how can I offer what's not around? But if you have a you know a couple hundred acres, you want to provide a bunch of stuff. Even at the hundred acre plus level, you can get a you know maybe two or three age stands of forest, or you maybe you have a far one or two age stands of forest and a grassland. All of that is going to provide more habitat um, in terms of uh, diversity of habitat, diversity of foods, and diversity of cover. Don't be scared, and um, this is something I, I give almost every talk with forest and wildlife. Is don't be scared of logging and harvesting your property. It's a great wildlife practice, especially if you've got loggers that are following the BMPs, which they're supposed to do anyway. Um, and if you do it in a way that's gonna reach your management goals, that's that's awesome. Uh, and, and, you know, many times timber and wildlife goals don't always align in terms of the forest logging practice. Um, so make sure you talk to a forester about what your main goals are so they can make sure to give you um, the best information and advice possible on how you'd want to potentially harvest your property. Um, better bet, you know, on top of getting a forest management plan, using a forester, uh, if you are thinking about uh, logging your property, uh, our department always recommends trying to use a consulting forester uh, because they tend to be able to get um, their costs back and then some with how well and they are tapped into the markets and know loggers and know who's the best logger to use in your given situation. So, um, and overall, making sure you have uh, regeneration going on and, and, and overall, uh, it's going to have a, a major wildlife benefit. Um, so don't hesitate to contact your local division of forestry or fish and wildlife folks to help develop your plan. Um, they'll also be able to identify potential resources and financial assistance based on your goals. Uh, and they'll be able to point you in the direction of those that you need to talk to to help get those goals on the ground. Uh, there's some specific native grass info um, from Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife there, uh, as well as uh, there's the Southeastern Grassland Initiative that has an entire guide to grasslands in the Mid-South and all kinds of resources associated with it. With that, there's my contact info. Don't hesitate to reach out and I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. Hey, it's Scott Cronin. How are you, sir? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. Hey, I've, I've got a couple questions. Uh, my first question is, is uh, what you're hearing as far as talk along Pond River and forest management with the beaver situation. Um, and my second question is, um, we have so many uh, multitudes of landowners currently, uh, and we have a lot of people that are really interested in forestry management that don't actually own land. Um, so that brings me to what I want to talk about, and, and that is that um, we have a lot of people that are in production agriculture, and one of the things that they hate the worst in production agriculture, if they're not benefiting from the leasing or economic return of wildlife, is fighting wildlife on their crops. So are you all still running into a, a major wall? when it comes time to contact private landowners to start talking to them about succession because they know that even if they look at it for economic timber uh, return that they are going to actually be creating better habitat and having more game issues. So um, I'll tackle question two first. Um, the, I have not really run into a lot of landowners that uh, are worried about doing things like logging and creating more habitat for deer and worried about damage associated with that increased population. I run into a lot of agricultural producers that are complaining about deer damage. Um, a lot of times they're folks that are leasing property um, where we run into conflicts, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this situation out in your neck of the woods, where we run into conflicts where the landowner um, potentially even, you know, is, is an absentee landowner that inherited the property um, are trying to get as much economic return off of it as possible are leasing the ground they have for farming and then also leasing the ground they have for hunt leasing, uh, which creates this dilemma that is pretty darn common where you have two folks that are paying the landowner for very opposite uh, goals. One wants a lot more deer. The other one wants a lot less deer. Um, 
And we run into that situation probably a lot more than we run into the one that you're talking about where they're worried about creating habitat. Um, it's, we're getting to the point now though, where folks, especially, you know, Western Kentucky are getting, even with grain prices the way they were, getting 50, $60 an acre and, and hunt leases. Um, so they're, they're really seeing dollar signs um, and are kind of just letting, letting the farmers deal with it. Um, and they're, you know, in many ways, ignoring it, uh, knowing that the farmers won't give up the land because they can't find more land to farm. It creates a headache all around and there's no solution at all. Um, so that's a bigger problem in general. Uh, the forest management side, um, getting farmers that own their property to um, care about the trees on their property outside of just like, I wanna cut my trees to get some money is, is, a, is a dilemma that we have um, where, you know, forest management uh, is more than just cutting trees down when the logger shows up and says he wants to cut your trees. Um, and that's, that's a big problem that we have. And, and that's probably one of the bigger things that the, the White Oak people are pointing to is a lack of management long-term goals from landowners where you have folks that are, are showing up thinking short term, White Oak is going for $1.50 a board foot. I can make you some money right now. Let me go in and they high grade everything and then they just leave crud left. Um, that's, that's one of our biggest dilemmas um, across the board right now. And it's one that the um, forest industry is pointing to and blaming themselves for. And then they're also blaming landowners quite a bit on it as uh, as well, and that they're not actively managing their properties. Um, it it creates a pretty big dilemma of the folks, get them involved in forest management. It's a generational thing where what you do now is really not gonna benefit you at all. It's gonna benefit your grandkids. And that's hard to grasp with our with many folks, especially folks that live in that money in the fall. And those are the bigger dilemmas that we run into. Beaver side, uh, um, other than trying to get more folks to trap beavers right now without a fur market, um, that's hard. Uh, and, you know, Stacy White there and, and UTK is, is constantly trying to organize uh, to, to get more folks out there to help out with the situations out in your side of the state. Um, I don't know, you know, I know there's a couple watersheds that still have a bounty in place. I don't know if it's going to how do you get folks on board without paying them uh, wildlife um, damage management money uh, for for control trapping money is going to be interesting to see because, you know, a beaver pelt's going for 10, 15 bucks. That's not enough to get most folks out there. Um, you know, fleshing a beaver pelt's hard work and takes time. And uh, I think $10 is not going to get them to do it. Um, where if you wait and get people in the summer that want to pay $300 to get you come out and trap the same five beavers, uh, I think that's where, you know, I think local government's going to have to step up to try to incentivize things in some way, shape, or form. Um, I don't know how that's going to play out, though. Did that get, your, get you kind of answered there, Scott? Yeah, right now, um, particularly where I'm at, is, you know, the Peabody White City area, um, it's not to bash the department. It's, you know, you, you've got your neighbors. Some of those neighbors are government and some of those neighbors are private landowners. And um, it's, it's a tough battle right now with, uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. The ecosystem and habitat that the beaver can create is wanted by many, especially on the waterfowl side. And it's, it's hated by those in the production ag side. And when you wear both hats in your community, it's, uh, it's the Hatfields and McCoys. Yep. Yeah, I know you live in my world there. I understand that. Uh, and I feel your pain. Um, it, it, it is tough. And, and in, in many situations got to be handled at a, you know, specific, every, every situation is going to have to be handled differently, which is not a great situation. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and unfortunately, probably a lot of work for folks like you. Um, so, um, uh, if there's anything you, you need for me in terms of helping out as best I can, please reach out. Um, and I'm anxiously looking forward to whatever student you sent us to camp this year. Cause they're always awesome. Yeah, um, I saw a few other, <laughs> I saw a few other questions, um, that I want to make sure I get to, 
Uh, the BMP do documents, um, John, if you wait here, uh, give me a second after the questions and I'll, I'll, I'll get you a link and I'll put it in the chat box. Um, let me know if you're able to, to hang around. If not, what I can do is I can email them to Adam and, and maybe he can get them to you. Okay, I'll, I'll find them after we're done here and I'll, I'll put them in the chat document. Um, and then Don, um, do hickory and sassafras, sassafras have any benefits for deer, turkey and rabbits? Uh, well, both of them, when they're, um, you know, young trees, saplings, um, they are, are browsable species. Um, and hickories uh, for, for deer aren't heavily used outside of browsing on the plants. Um, folks kind of argue about this all the time, whether or not deer will eat them. Uh, I think if you find broken or, or uh, broken shells or where they can access the actual fleshy inside parts, they will consume them. Um, but I don't think they're a high preference as like they are in terms of benefit for things like squirrels, right? Um, sassafras, uh, although it's kind of in trouble um, currently with uh, a new um, pathogen that we have in the state um, with laurel wilt disease, um, it's kind of, it's not high on the list uh, for any of those species. Uh, rabbits would probably be the one that would be most likely to use it. Um, with trying to either girdle uh, saplings or, or younger trees uh, for food benefits. Uh, in terms of turkey, um, hickory nuts are hard for, for turkeys to consume, just like deer. Uh, it's not like the, the pin oaks or, or the, the white oaks where they can, you know, handle getting that down the, the gullet. Um, so it's, it's, it's not nearly as, as beneficial uh, for sure. Dr. Springer, this is Jason, and um, one one question that I wanted to mention, and I, I apologize if I missed when you answered it, but I know you've had a lot of information to present in, in uh, not a real long time and a lot of questions coming in, but specifically, I'm getting several questions about switchgrass based on the price you know comparatively speaking switchgrass is not quite as expensive as a lot of our other native season grasses if they're not if it's not being cost shared and so and it's a little bit easier to plant with a conventional drill um so how do you feel about and there was a question that alluded to it switchgrass for deer cover primarily bedding and cover so I did see that I was trying to work my way back up the chat box. So Jason, I do appreciate you bringing that back, back up. Um, so switchgrass, you know, it is a native species. So that's a, that's a great starting point there. Um, it, it can um, definitely provide a good bit of cover. Um, I'm trying to think here of switchgrass, how it holds up to, well, you know, like our storm events here recently. Um whether or not it holds the structure in place, like uh, many of the other, like big blue stem will hold uh, structure a little bit better in switchgrass, I think in some certain cases and, and gamma grass. Um, so that's a, that's a big important component for a lot of our game species like uh, rabbits and quail that it just doesn't fall over. And then they just basically create a desert of cover for them. Uh, and the same holds true for deer. So Jason, do you remember, does that hold up well under, under weather events like snow? I can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, it, it, it tends to lay over and lodge more so than, than some of the other ones you're talking about with, you know, or just based on their structure. But I've got a lot of people that just look at the cost of big blue stem and little blue stem. And, you know, um, Adam says if it's planted thick, it'll hold. Man. You know, that's something that they're, that they're asking me a lot of questions about. Jason, we're seeing it kind of break down. It doesn't have the structural strength as some of the other natives do, but um, John and them over at Roundstone has got, you know, some areas that he'll let you go look at, like um, Caleb and Shane Butler. Sometimes they'll, they'll have some stuff. And then do you, are y'all familiar with uh, Dewdrop Drop Drills, Dewey, up in Iowa and what he has? Uh-huh. No, no, I mean, I wouldn't say I, I know of him yet, but. Yeah, that that's a that's a great thing but it like the tornado that just come through here a lot of our landowners that have um the the switchgrass over towards dawson springs what what they noticed was that the heavy rains and the wind is it's just a it's a carpet mat it's a mess 
Yeah, that 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 was my uh, thought. Was that um, from what I remember, it gets knocked over pretty easy, and therefore it, it kind of loses all of its value when that happens. Um, so, if, and at, to Adam's point, my only concern. Um, so John mentioned something there. I'll get to it here. Uh, my only concern would be if you make it so thick that you know your bigger species may able may be able to deal with it pretty well. But if you're after things like quail, turkey, uh, rabbits. The, those thick, thick stands are almost like walls or impenetrable areas for those species. Um, so that, that you know, you're, you're kind of managing just for one specific species that actually quite, does quite well in, in, in almost anything, right? Um, so, you know, on a smaller scale, you know, if you're thinking like um, putting, like, you know, maybe you have a 10 acre field, putting two acres or three acres and have these heavy switchgrass, that wouldn't be that bad if you have other things around that those animals can get to in certain events or if it all falls over. Um, but I, you know, it, it, diversity is always better in so many, for so many reasons. Um, and this is, you know, I, I get the cost. And, you know, if it, if it comes down to between um, plant and switchgrass or leaving fescue, I'd say plant the switchgrass uh, for sure. You know, native grass is better. Switchgrass, you can actually graze. So that might be a way to keep it back and thin. Um, so yeah, so the shield wall idea is, is held up pretty well, right? It does grow thick, tall, and, and quickly. Um, Scott, to your point, so it's it it's not perfect. Is is probably the thing. Like I said, it's not perfect. Um, and if it's the difference between plant and something or not, I would say go for it. Um, so. Jason says I sprayed all mine because it got way too thick after a few years of burning. Even with burning, it got too thick, Jason. Wow. Um, it's, it's one of those where, yeah, that, that whole idea behind planting, you know, monoculture um, stands of it is, is not uh, holding uh, up as well, well as people thought it would, I think. All right. Um, John, if you can reach out to me, uh, just simply shoot me an email, Matt Springer at uky.edu um, to, to remind me and I'll get you that contact. Oh, forgot the EER there. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, um, any, I think that was kind of it. Any other questions? I know everybody's probably ready to go, but the the Dr. S uh, Stringer talked to us at our A and R update in October, and some of the graph graphs that he showed of projected oak numbers in the state of Kentucky were were very alarming. And as a as a deer hunter and just overall wildlife person, you know, to not have that mast crop out there in the woods, it's just I guess unnerving and a little bit alarming. I know you sort of alluded to it with several different practices that you mentioned, whether it's forest stand improvement or or prescribed burns, but with the age of our timber and all those factors, I mean, what would you advise people to do to try to help combat that situation? Well, well um, it's not simple. That's, that's the bigger problem is, um, we're seeing that it's a it's an incredibly complex issue. Even our managed lands where we have foresters in charge of things like Daniel Boone trying to get white Oak. Um, there's this kind of a pinch point in age where you get some regeneration young. It just doesn't seem to transfer over into the mid story at the rates that we need it to, to replace our losses. Um, and the, the numbers that Jason's mentioned is in about 30 to 40 years, our white Oak numbers are going to be abysmal uh, and that are left. Um, our, to the point where the message is so strong that the bourbon industry is throwing tons of money at us to try to grow more white oak because they see the writing on the wall in terms of the complications for their product. Um, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, even, you know, I mentioned we we're up at clay and one of the reasons we we're up at clay is because they aren't seeing the white oak recruitment into their stands and they think they're, they're trying to figure out what they're doing wrong because they're heavily managing for it. They're doing mid-story removals, they're doing burns. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're cutting um, and they're still not seeing recruitment. Uh, and, and it's, you know, to where we're, we were talking about taking, you know, um, 
a disc into the middle of the forest to, to try to scarify up the, the area to, to get those white oaks down into the soil uh, to germinate is one of the thoughts that's causing the problem. Um, you know, we, we don't think that, you know, like other places in the Northeast where deer herbivory can really knock back um, regeneration efforts, we aren't seeing that in a lot of places uh, as a limiting factor. So we're trying to figure it out. And um, it's, it's a complicated issue and it's, it's a, in, in the forefront of all the foresters and all the wildlife managers trying to figure out and get more white oak grown in the woods because we have a, a real concern about what things are going to look like specifically in Kentucky, but also throughout the white oak range, um, especially southern white oak range as we move forward. It's not good. Um, there's a lot of money that's trying to be um, moved uh, through our NRCS equip dollars to, to help that process along. Um, and there's a lot of, of um, chess playing going on at, 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 at that governmental level to make sure that there's more and more funds being um, freed up to do that uh, through the, the forest management um, processes. Uh, and all the plans that are getting in place to be approved for uh, cost share assistance to make sure that landowners can get them on the ground. Uh, so all of that is happening. Um, it's all actually being run out of UK and our Department of Forestry um, with Dr. Stringer as the, the focal person for that entire 24 st state program. Uh, it's, it's sitting at I don't know how many millions of dollars right now funneling in of efforts and, and people being hired to try to, I mean, there's a tree geneticists that they're trying to figure out how to grow better white oaks for bourbon aspect. They're trying to grow better white oaks for in terms of speed of growth and ability to compete um, in orchard settings. You can go up to Buffalo Trace and on the tour, you'll pass one of our, our white oak orchards uh, that we have in place. So there's a lot going on with it. Um, and, and we're, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that are working on it, trying to, to get it to go uh, because it's a major concern. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I, I just think people may not realize like you said, how bad our numbers could be if they continue in the direction that they're headed and not the not so distant future. Yeah, I think the best thing they can do is if you have a forest to stand get a forest management plan so you can get things and understand what may need to happen in terms of trying to grow some white oak. Get a forester there that can help you thinking about if you want white oak for wildlife reasons, um, they'll try to at least give you some advice based on the stance that you have on how to do that. Anything else? Well, it's very, very informative. Well, if anyone ever thinks of a, or has a question that pops on their brain later tonight uh, or tomorrow, um, you know, add them through my email in there. Don't hesitate to reach out and um, try to get you whatever information you need. Thank you, Dr. Rick Springer. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Appreciate everybody else coming out. And uh, for those that are still on, if you don't mind, fill out that survey before you leave. And um, we'll go ahead and I'm going to end the recording. And uh, like I said, we appreciate everybody joining us tonight.